Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Hashtag, hashtag, administration, air conditioning, Dimnit Chapel. It's my, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce uh, not only a personal friend, but also one of Hope College's Board of Trustee members. Matt Scogan is a 2002 graduate of Hope College. Not long ago, he was sitting right where you are. And upon being graduated, went to graduate school to Harvard, worked in the government at Washington, D.C. at the highest levels, worked um, in Wall Street now in New York City, and has become uh, just an important person, um, a conversation partner, a, a, a lover of, of the gospel. All of his accomplishments, which are many, none of them is as important as that he is a man who embodies a love for Christ. He's taken his education at Hope that embodies a, a, a full liberal art experience and has applied that to public policy and um, shaping shaping the way people think. Um, and it's just a great joy, Matt, to have you here. Would you please give Hope's own Matt Scogan a warm welcome back home? Thanks, Matt. Don't worry about Thank time. You. Thank you, Trig. Thank you uh, for having me back. I, I love being back in Michigan for the cool, crisp fall weather. Uh, so, so thank you uh, for that. It really is a privilege to be back here. I, I love, I love this place. I love Hope College. I love Dimnant Chapel. Uh, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and I think that over the course of my four years at Hope, that I sat where you are sitting now around 400 times. And, and I spent most of those 400 services doing two things. One, uh, listening to the message, of course, and two, staring at a girl. And the girl had basically no idea that I even existed, and that's a story for another time, but suffice it to say that that girl and I have been married for 15 years, <laughs> and we're, um, thank you, and we're raising three kids, we're raising three kids together in New York City, and, and here's the thing, here's the thing about living in New York City. See, uh, around 90% of Americans believe that there is a God, like they believe in something. The 10% of Americans who don't believe in anything all happen to live with us on the island of Manhattan. <laughs> and that makes for a somewhat interesting place to raise a family. And this morning I want to talk for a few minutes about, about what it's like being a person of faith in environments that can at times be sort of hostile to Christianity. You know, one of the things that people say to me or have said to me over the years is, you know, something along the lines of, boy, Matt, you, you went to Harvard after Hope, uh, you worked in politics, you're now on Wall Street. I mean, aren't those pretty messy places for a Christian? And my response to that is always the same. My response to that is to say, yes, they are messy places for a Christian, and that's exactly why I want to be there. See, to me, the fact that these are areas often characterized by greed and hubris and unbelief in God, to me, that's all the more reason for Christians to run toward them, not away from them. And I actually credit, I actually credit Hope College with giving me that point of view. By the way, Hope is such a great name for a school. I mean, you know this, but every other college and university in the world has a really boring, uninspiring name. Every other college is either named for the geography in which they're located or for some rich donor who gave a lot of money. But Hope has this beautifully aspirational name that says so much about who we are and what we offer the world. And in the world, at least the parts of the world where I've spent my life, what I've discovered is that true hope is the thing that's lacking. It's the thing that's lacking, and I remember uh, one specific instance early in my career when I was really struck by, by this lack of hope. In uh, the fall of 2006, I was appointed by President Bush to be the senior advisor for domestic finance at the Treasury Department. I was, I was 27 years old at the time. I was completely unqualified for this job, which was a fact that they just somehow missed. So they hired me, and a year and a half after they hired me, the United States entered the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. And I really hope that those two facts are not connected. But nevertheless, uh, they hired me, and I was about a year into this job, and, and we were starting to see some early warning signs of the financial crisis, and it showed up in the, in the mortgage market, in the housing market. And I remember uh, one afternoon, 
the, the Secretary of the Treasury, his name was Hank Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury uh, convened a small group of people at his house to discuss this issue, what we were seeing in the, in the mortgage market. And there, may be, there were maybe five or six of us there, and, and I was one of them. And he starts off this meeting uh, by saying that the following day, he has a cabinet meeting with the president. And in the cabinet meeting, he wants to give the, the president an update on what's happening and, and maybe a preview of what some of our policy options might be if things get really bad. And so he says this, and then he opens it up for, for our input. And for some reason, everybody, everybody immediately stares at me, like, let's see what the 27-year-old senior advisor has to say about this one. And, and so without thinking, which is never a good thing to do, without thinking, I blurted out the following. I said, well, I think there are really three things the president needs to know about housing finance. And, and then I paused. And while I paused, I said a silent prayer to myself. I said, Lord, please help me to think of three smart things to say. <laughs> about housing finance. And while I was saying this little prayer to me, Hank Paulson's wife, Wendy, walks into the living room. And she's carrying, uh, in one hand, a cold pitcher of lemonade, and in the other hand, a tray of glasses. Now, this is August in Washington, DC. It was a hot, humid day, much like this one. And uh, the, the Paulsons, they're big environmental activists, and they are not big fans of air conditioning. So it was hot and humid in their living room. And she's coming with this pitcher of lemonade, and I, you know, I can see the condensation forming on the outside of it, and it looks like something from a commercial. I can't wait. I can't wait to get my hands on a glass of that lemonade. But before anybody could say anything, Hank Paulson says to his wife, no thanks, honey. We're okay. We just need a few hours to work. Sort of this like awkward moment between a married couple, and I immediately start doing this mental calculus thinking, like, I wonder how big of a career mistake it would be for me to raise my hand and say, actually, I'll take a glass. <laughs> and while I try to collect my thoughts and look around the room, because I still have to come up with three smart things to say, I look around the room at my colleagues, and, and I look them in the eye, and I realize something. I realize that they were really, really scared. They were scared. Now, this was a tense time. Obviously, I was pretty nervous myself, but there, there was a big difference. My colleagues felt the weight of the world on their shoulders. And me, well, I was willing to stop and have a glass of lemonade. Why? Because I was grounded in hope. Real, true, old-school, biblical hope. See, the word hope, the word hope has has uh, been faded over time. And today, most people's concept of hope is nothing more than a sort of weak desire. I hope the weather's good this weekend. I hope I do okay on my exam next week. I hope the Patriots don't win the Super Bowl again. <laughs> but true hope, true hope isn't a weak desire at all. Rather, it's a confident expectation about the future. It's an assurance of how things are going to turn out. And as Christians, that's exactly what we have, an assurance of how things are going to turn out. Why? Because we've read to the end of the book. We know how the story ends, and that means as scary as things might get here in the middle, we know exactly, exactly how it's going to turn out. And you know, if you're paying attention to, the, to everything going on in the world today, and I hope you are, you know that the present is pretty scary. In a lot of ways, it's scarier today than it was 10 years ago during the financial crisis. And that means that the world is in dire need of this hope, God's hope. And here we are, here we are at Hope College this small school in this small corner of the world, and we have exactly what the world needs. We do. College, by the way, is a, is a time when you're thinking about what to do with the rest of your life, obviously. And if you don't mind, I'd like to weigh in on that for a minute. This is my view. This will offend some of you, by the way, but you know, when we, when we all get to heaven, you can come up to me and you can tell me that I was right. <laughs> this will offend some of you, but, but my view... <laughs> My view is that we already have enough good people going into full-time ministry. What the world desperately needs more of is people who are willing to run into the darkest secular corners of the world and bring God's hope there. And you know, you might say to yourself, boy, that sounds pretty intimidating. I don't know if I can do that. Bring God's hope to the dark secular corners of the world. And what I've learned is that it's not nearly as intimidating or nearly as scary as it sounds. Because as Christians, we don't have to have all the answers. All we have to do is become someone who points others to the person of Jesus Christ. There's this great interaction in John 1. It's between these two guys, uh, Philip and Nathaniel. And Philip says to Nathaniel, he says, I think I've found the Messiah. 
I think I found the one the prophets were talking about. I think I found the Savior, the one we've been waiting for. And, and Nathaniel, who's a skeptic at this point, he's a total skeptic, he says, uh, uh, Philip first says, I think I found him, it's Jesus from Nazareth. And then Nathaniel, the skeptic, says back, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And at the time, it, it doesn't mean much to us. That's a legitimate question. Nazareth is like this podunk town. Nothing good did come from Nazareth. And, and I love how Philip responds. Philip doesn't try to defend it. He doesn't try to reason it out. All he says is, come and see. Come and see. I will take you to Jesus, and you can find out for yourself. You can make your own determination. And as Christians, that's all we have to do. I, I had a boss once who discovered that I was a Christian, and he loved it. It became this, like, running joke for him. Whenever something slightly unpleasant would happen at work, it could be like a, like a jammed printer. He would say to me, he would say, okay, Matt, where's God now? I'm like, why did God allow this to happen? And it, it took me a while, but I finally came up with a good response. My response was to simply say, I don't know. Why don't you ask him yourself? See, as Christians, all we have to do is point people to the person of Jesus. And a modern-day Nathaniel, a modern-day skeptic, wouldn't say Nazareth. A modern-day skeptic would be more like this former boss who says, Christianity? I mean, you're really trying to tell me that there's a loving God when the world looks like this? When the world is full of this kind of injustice? And the amazing thing is you and I don't need to have an answer to that. All we need to do is say, come and see. Come and check Jesus out for yourself. Because what I've discovered at Harvard, in Wall Street, in politics, is a shocking, a shocking level of ignorance about who the person of Jesus is. And the reason it's so shocking is because it's, it's not like Jesus is some minor historical figure. He's by far the most famous person who's ever lived. There's more books written about him, more music about him, more poetry and artwork about Jesus than anybody else in human history. And anybody who, who, who wants to have at least one shred of intelligence owes it to themselves to find out at least a little bit about who Jesus is. If, if, if an alien, stay with me on this, if an alien landed in your dorm room tonight and it was up to you to explain to the alien everything that's happened in human history so far. You would start by saying, uh, okay, this is weird, uh, but it's the year 2017. And the alien would say, stop right there. Like 2017 what? Like 2017 years after what? And you would say, okay, good question, alien. Uh, 2017 years after Jesus, I guess. And the alien would say, okay, then I wanna hear about Jesus. And you would realize then and there, with the alien in your dorm room, that that's where the curriculum begins. Class 101 on being an intelligent human being is, who is Jesus Christ? And that's why Hope College makes so much sense, because we offer world-class academics on par with the world's top schools, but we also recognize that you cannot be a truly educated person unless you know something about the person of Jesus Christ. And what's amazing is that when you start to learn who Jesus is, you'll discover that what he offers you is true hope, this assurance about the future, this assurance about how things will turn out in the end. And that means, that means that whatever life throws at you, that as scary as it gets, you can look it in the face and say, bring it on. And while you do, I'm going to have a glass of lemonade. Go in peace.